Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. For all of you who are regulars at our Lunch and Learn series, you will notice that I am still not alone, Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education and the regular host of the Lunch and Learn series. My name is Dr. Beth Greek Pollelli, and I am the Chair of Holocaust Studies at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. I will be hosting today's Lunch and Learn America and the Holocaust three part series. And welcome to the second portion of this series. Thank you immediately goes out to our community partners for supporting this series. A special thanks to the Powell Family Foundation, Museum Educators of Puget Sound, Museum of Flight, the Northwest Film Forum, Puget Sound Honor Flight, Southwestern Seattle Historical Society, and Washington State Archives. This program is being recorded and will be available on the Holocaust Center's website starting tomorrow. For those of you who were with us last week for the first part of our series, you might have heard me already say that the whole idea for this series began at Pacific Lutheran University last year when no one had yet ever heard of COVID-19. We were planning the annual Powell Heller Conference for Holocaust Education, and we decided it was time to address all of the complicating components of America and the country's reaction to Hitler's persecution of the Jewish community. Today's program explores the role of the United States government and its efforts to rescue victims of the Holocaust. While many of us have heard many stories about inaction or action of the US government, there were many attempts to assist Jews and other victims to escape from war-torn Europe. One such example that I would like to mention here today is the story of almost a thousand mostly Jews and some Christians who in July 1944 left recently liberated Italy. August 3rd, 1944, these refugees landed in New York. They were transferred to Fort Ontario in Oswego in, up in New York State. And here on the screen, of our first pictures, this is community of refugees separated by a fence uh, from the greater community of Oswego. For many of the survivors, they were reluctant to step into a camp surrounded by wire, as we can certainly understand. Yet as one survivor put it, quote, they offered us ice cream and other treats, so we knew it could not be the camp we had come from. These refugees were referred to as President Franklin D. Roosevelt's guests, which meant that they had no legal standing in the United States. The guests were also required to sign paperwork stating that they promised to return to Europe after the war ended. While at Fort Ontario, the refugees had barracks for each separate family. And here kind of you can see some of that in the background. There was food and children in the camp were allowed to attend the local schools. Social workers also came to the camp to teach the adult refugees English. Despite the improved surroundings, the refugees now found themselves in at Fort Ontario, they were still not exactly free. They could not leave the premises unless it was to attend school. When the war did finally end, President Roosevelt was dead. And the new president, Harry Truman, allowed the refugees to apply for US citizenship. The shelter was officially February 1946 and now serves as a museum site. While this might not seem like such a big deal, helping a thousand people, I would argue that to those 1000 people, this was a life-saving measure. Today's speaker, Dr. Rebecca Airbuilding, comes to us from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, where she worked as an archivist and a curator from 2003 to 2015. And since 2015, she has served as a historian for the museum's exhibition on America's responses to the Holocaust. Today's talk 
is based on her award-winning book, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Dr. Erbelding's work highlights the work of the War Refugee Board and its efforts to save Jewish lives. Dr. Erbelding will respond to questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type your questions in at any time. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for being with us today. We're so excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. And thank you, thank you everybody for having me. I, um, oh, sorry, I need to share my screen now. Um, I have been tuning into some of these programs as, as I've been able and, and love them. And so I'm so grateful to everybody in Seattle and throughout the Pacific Northwest for, for welcoming me here and for making all of these programs possible for, for me and for everybody else. Um, I think we're all learning so much from them. Um, it's important to note, first of all, thank you for the great introduction that um, while I am a historian at the Holocaust Museum, what I'm going to share today is my own research and my views do not necessarily represent my colleagues at the museum. Um, the subtitle of my book, which, which I think you can see on the screen here, uh, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe, I think this, the title surprises a lot of people, this idea that American ma America made any effort um, to save the Jews of Europe. I think in the United States, we have a very simplified understanding of our role during the Holocaust. Often the assumption is either that the American people knew nothing about what was going on, um, nothing about what was happening to Jews of Europe, that liberation was a total surprise to Americans, and that was the first time Americans learned about the Holocaust. Conversely, there's this understanding that the US government knew everything about what was happening, that they had a lot of information, but they didn't do anything about it. And of course, history is always more complicated than that, and neither of those assumptions are entirely accurate. In reality, Americans had a lot of information about the Nazi persecution of Jews almost immediately uh, in 1933, as soon as Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. The spring of 1933, Roosevelt is being inaugurated as the 32nd President of the United States. The country is in the midst of the Great Depression. We're in the middle of the first 100 days of the Roosevelt administration, and Americans are seeing headline news about what is happening to Jews in Germany, to this first wave of persecution, the boycott of Jewish-owned businesses, the burning of books, Jews being kicked out of the civil service in Germany. You can see here a headline from the Spokane Daily Chronicle. You see that the main headline is that women will be allowed in beer parlors, that, that this is the end of prohibition. Um, and women are suddenly going to be allowed to drink beer. Um, but on the side here on the left, you can also see the, ger the German boycott of Jews starts ahead of schedule. This is March 29th, 1933. The scheduled boycott of Jewish owned businesses was scheduled for April 1st. And so not only do readers in Spokane know that this is happening, they know that it's already begun. They know in advance that it has already begun. Um, and there is reaction to headline news across the country to all of these new laws and restrictions um, persecuting German Jews. There are petitions sent from many, many states, um, hundreds of organizations and communities send petitions to the State Department or to Roosevelt asking him to and them to do something about this. So this is um, the Jewish community of Salem, Oregon sending a petition in April 1933 to the President of the United States. And they say, and again, this is April 1933. Um, Hitler has been in power for about three and a half months, that they want him to make formal representations to the government of the Republic of Germany on behalf of all the German Jews and solemn protest against the continuous of the continuance of the bitter campaign of anti-Semitic persecution now being waged in that country all to the end that there be promptly brought about a cessation of, the, of such diabolical program of slaughter of our people and confiscation of their properties. Again, this is very early. This is 1933. The Holocaust, the mass murder of Jews won't begin for another eight years. And yet Americans throughout the country know that something terrible is happening in Nazi Germany. 
The problem is that Americans also have a very short attention span. And after the spring and summer of 1933, where there are petitions and rallies and marches, it kind of falls off the front pages. Americans refocus on domestic issues, on, on recovery from the Great Depression, on the beginning of the Roosevelt administration. And they largely stop paying attention to what is happening to the Jews of Europe. Um, they pay attention again at Kristallnacht, at, at the attacks in November 1938 on Jewish uh, on Jews and, Jer and Jewish owned businesses throughout the Third Reich, which now includes Austria and parts of Czechoslovakia. Um, so you can see this is the Seattle Daily Times for the day after Kristallnacht. Nazis sack Jews stores and churches. And so that's interesting, right? That they're using the word churches as opposed to synagogues because they think their readers understand the concept of, of a religious house. And so they're going to use the word chur uh, churches. But you can also see that this is the same week as the 1938 midterm elections. So you see GOP gains start fight for power talking about the coming 1940 election. But this is headline news. Kristallnacht is headline news and will remain headline news in the United States for about three weeks. Um, but Americans are still, while they're sympathetic to what is happening to Jews in Europe, they're not necessarily willing to make their own country part of the solution. They are still not necessarily willing to accept Jewish immigrants. You can see here uh, two Gallup polls, both from November 1938. This is late November, it's right after Kristallnacht. Um, the same people are answering both questions. So the first question is, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? And 94% of Americans disapprove. And then the same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% of Americans say no. Kristallnacht is really part of the beginning of a refugee crisis. Hundreds of thousands of people um, are applying to immigrate to the United States at this time. And the US first has no refugee policy. So if you are coming to the United States, you are coming as an immigrant, you are coming under our immigration laws, which had not changed since the 1920s and would not change again until the 1960s. So we have very restrictive immigration laws in place since the 1920s. And it places barriers on people, um, barriers on what country you can come from, how many people can immigrate to the United States from each country each year, and sets up a lot of hoops that you need to jump through, lots of paperwork that you need to present. Um, you need to present an affidavit from an American saying that you will not become a public charge. All of these pieces of paperwork make it a very long process, and none of that is waived for people who are escaping anti-Semitic persecution in 1938, 1939, 1940, 1941. And there is no public push to change those laws. The vast majority of Americans consistently polled are not interested in changing our immigration laws. After Germany invades Poland in 1939, Americans are urged to leave areas of war. Germany forces all US consulates to close in the summer of 1941. So just as Jews are being forced into ghettos, just as the Nazis start talking about mass killing, there are fewer and fewer American boots on the ground, witnesses, reporters, officials, tourists, who can bear witness to what is happening. And so America is having its own heated debates about whether we should be an isolationist country or whether we should intervene on the side of the allies in, in World War II, which is now ongoing. Um, so Americans are really much more focused on that than of anything that is happening to European Jews. Pearl Harbor ends this debate and we enter the war on the side of the allies. And for most of 1942, the headlines are about the war. The headlines are about war preparation, about people being drafted, about speculation as to where the allies are going to strike the Nazis. Um, that's what the headlines are about. It's not about what is happening to European Jews. My book, The War of, um, Rescue Board, um, is really the story about what happens next. What happens during the war as more and more information starts to come out about what is happening to the Jews of Europe. Um, really, the historians date um, the, the main piece of information that we have um, to August 1942. Gerhard Rigner, 
the secretary of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, um, learns third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan, that all of these reports that, that Americans are receiving kind of second and third hand of Jews are being rounded up and they're being sent to the East to work. He learns that this all has a point, that the Nazis have a plan um, to round up and murder all of the Jews of Europe. You can see here, this is a, a copy of a cable that he sent, or that, that was sent through London to Stephen Wise, who was the most famous rabbi in America, about the news that Rigner had learned. So you can see it says, received alarming report that in Fuhrer's headquarters, plan discussed and under consideration, all Jews in countries occupied or controlled Germany, number three and a half to four million, should after deportation and concentration in the East, at one blow exterminated to resolve once and for all Jewish question in Europe. So Rigner first tries to send this information through the US State Department to Stephen Wise. Stephen Wise is the most influential rabbi in America. He knows President Roosevelt. If Rigner can get Wise and Roosevelt, get their eyes on this information, then obviously the United States will do something about it. The State Department blocks Rigner's message. Um, they refuse to transmit it to Stephen Wise, saying this is just a war rumor. There's no sense in getting people riled up for something that is just a rumor. Um, so you can see that, that Wise finally gets it via Western Union. They bypass the State Department to get this message to him. And by November 1942, it is public information. Um, you can see on the left and on the center articles, um, Wise asserts to reporters that 2 million Jews have been slain. He, he says that the State Department has confirmed this information. And so this is when historians really date the knowledge of the Holocaust in the United States. By 1942, it is assumed to be true by reporters, by newspapers, by the US government, that the Nazis are doing this, that they have a plan, they are rounding up Jews throughout Europe, and they are trying to wipe them out. Um, at the same time, November 1942 is the same month that the Allies land in North Africa, that we finally strike with the military against um, the Third Reich. And that means that American troops are thousands of miles away from the killing centers where most people are being murdered. So the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union all decide amongst themselves that there's nothing we can do about this now. We are thousands of miles away. We certainly can't rescue them. So what we're going to do is we're going to issue a statement. And they issue what is called the Joint Declaration. It says that they, you can see an article about it on the right, that they condemn Germany's bestial policy of cold-blooded extermination. And they say, we will have war crimes trials after the war. We're not going to promise rescue but we will promise to hold the perpetrators to account after the war. The next year, 1943, is really a lost year. Americans know that this is happening, especially at least the people who are paying attention and reading the newspaper know that this is happening, but the US government really makes no effort to try to rescue anybody. Um, and more and more information is coming out. There are protests, again, there's even an Orthodox rabbi's march on Washington in October 1943. There are pageants called um, We Will Never Die that tour the country, um, proclaiming that there are millions of Jews being murdered and that the United States, particularly the US government, needs to do something about this. At this point in the story, the Treasury Department enters the picture, very unlikely heroes. Um, they had spent the summer of 1943 really arguing with the State Department. Um, the State Department was delaying humanitarian aid to be sent to Jews in Europe. You know, non-governmental organizations, um, aid groups wanted to, had been raising money and wanted to send clothing to Jews in Transnistria. They wanted to send food to Jews in France. And the State Department was blocking this from happening. Um, they claimed that this would inevitably fall into the hands of the Nazis and that it would not, um, it would be against America's war policy. And the Treasury Department was saying, well, they finally decide in the summer of 1943, even if a little bit falls into the hands of the Nazis, we will approve it if it seems like it can help people. Um, finally, after all of these delays, a Treasury Department official sneaks into the State Department's file room in December 1943, and he discovers that not only have all of these delays been deliberate, been this slow rollout to prevent the aid from going forward, 
but that the Assistant Secretary of State, Breckenridge Long, had specifically instructed US diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That they felt that this information was getting out to the public. And if the public did not know about what was happening to the Jews of Europe, they wouldn't be pressuring the US government to do something about it. One of the best things about studying the Treasury Department at this time is that the Secretary of the Treasury was Henry Morgenthau Jr. Um, he was not a finance guy at all, uh, but he was a good friend of President Roosevelt's. They, they lived near each other in upstate New York before the presidency. And Morgenthau was an incredible manager and a really good record keeper. Um, so one of the things that you can do actually is you can go online now and you can read through transcripts of almost all of Morgenthau's conversations during the entire 11 years that he was treasury secretary. Every report that crosses his desk, drafts of speeches, um, and transcripts of phone calls and of meetings. And so when I was writing the book, I could actually go through and I could read all of the discussions that he was having with his staff about all of these things kind of in real time. So in one meeting in December, 1943, Josiah Du Bois, who was the treasury department man who sneaks into the state department, he says, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the um, complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who is the Treasury Department's general counsel says, we are speaking as citizens now. And I always found that incredibly moving. This idea that, that Morgenthau's guys are coming to him and saying, this isn't necessarily a policy position. We don't necessarily think this is a politically good idea, but we are citizens of a democracy and we think our country is better than what the State Department is doing. So armed with all of this evidence, they decide we're not gonna negotiate with the State Department anymore. We're not gonna try to convince them to let this aid go through. We're not gonna try to convince them to be better. What we're going to do is we're going to take this away from them. And so they write a memo. This is a, an early draft of the memo uh, called Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jewish Population in Europe. And this is how it begins. One of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. Unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I'm certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German controlled Europe. And this government will share for all time responsibility for this extermination. So it was time to go to FDR, they said, and we are going to ask for a new deal. That's, that's actually the words one of them uses, knowing that it would resonate with FDR. Let's call it a new deal. So on January 16th, 1944, Morgenthau and two members of his staff go to Roosevelt and they convince him to issue an executive order establishing a war refugee board, a new government agency tasked with the relief and rescue of Jews in German controlled Europe. Um, it is officially headed by the secretaries of war, state, and treasury. It is unofficially completely a treasury department operation. Um, Henry Morgenthau stays incredibly involved. Their staff is, is staffed at the treasury department. That's where their offices are. And the head of the war refugee board is pulled from one of Morgenthau's deputies, a man named John Paley, who had been in charge of the US sanctions program. So a very real job, um, and he becomes the director of this agency. Um, Morgenthau and the Treasury Department mean this. They mean it to be real. And so at the end of the war, um, 17 months later, this war refugee board had undoubtedly saved tens of thousands of lives. The War Refugee Board tries so many different things, um, projects in dozens of countries. I mean, it's it's something that, that always fascinated me, this idea that a lot of these men had never ever been to Europe and they're trying to guess what will resonate deep inside enemy territory. What difference can they make? And so a lot of times they're just shooting arrows in the dark. They're hoping to hit a target, um, but they have no idea what's working, what's not working, whether something's going to get intercepted. Um, and so they're trying everything they can think of um, in the final year of the war to save lives. So I'm just gonna give you a couple examples and tell you a few stories. Um, the same day in January, 1944, that Roosevelt issues the executive order, um, you can see 
John Paley, the head of the War Refugee Board here on the right, and then two members of his staff here. The same day that Roosevelt issues the executive order that the War Refugee Board is created, um, John Paley and his staff immediately streamlined the process that relief agencies were using to send money and aid into Europe. So like I said, it was taking the State Department months and months and months to approve things and they were delaying it. The, the War Refugee Board creates a situation where you could get approved within a week. Um, and by the end of the war, they had authorized about $11 million, which is $154 million today, to a whole host of different aid agencies. And that money was used to buy guns for the French underground. It was used to buy food for children in hiding. It was used to create false papers for Jews who were trying to live as Christians. Um, and it was used to uh, pay guides who were helping Jews escape over the borders into um, neutral territories. The board represents or appoints representatives in, in most of the neutral nations in Europe, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Turkey, in Portugal. Um, they are unsuccessfully try to get somebody into Spain and eventually somebody in London. Um, most of them are Treasury Department workers or aid workers, but the goal is to try to convince these nations to go along with us, right? These nations had been neutral, many of them, for the entirety of the war, playing both sides, trading with Nazi Germany, trading with the United States. And by 1944, by the time the War Refugee Board is created, it's pretty clear to most people that the Allies are going to win. And so the War Refugee Board takes advantage of this and puts pressure on the neutral nations, saying you've had it both ways this whole time. You know we're going to win. Why don't you curry some favor with us? What we want you to do is we want you to pass on intelligence about what your diplomats are seeing in Nazi territory. We want you to protest what the Nazis are doing. And we want you to send um, to um, allow more Jews over your borders. If somebody arrives at your doors, let them in. We will take care of them financially, but you need to let them into your country for safety. Um, and so they're leveraging this near certain allied victory in order to get these countries to play along and to join our fight. So from Washington, Paley lays out his strategy for the War Refugee Board. They are going to try to persuade the Nazis and their collaborators to stop the killing. They are going to try to rescue people on the margins of Nazi territory. So people who are in Yugoslavia or Romania or Bulgaria or France and get them into areas of safety and for people deep inside Nazi territory, in Germany, in Poland, in Hungary, they're going to try to keep these people alive as long as possible, keep them alive long enough to be liberated. So I'm gonna just give you a quick example of, of each of these things. Um, first, the War Refugee Board launches a propaganda warfare campaign. They send radio broadcasts into Nazi occupied territory and collaborating territory. They drop leaflets over these areas. Um, promising would-be perpetrators that they would be brought to justice at the end of the war, that we would be having um, war crimes trials. And so why would you become a war criminal now when the allies are going to win and you will be brought to justice? On March 24th, FDR issues a statement, which you can see here. Um, it begins, in one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the day of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. So this, this date, March 1944, is, is really pivotal in the history of the Holocaust because March 1944 is the month that the Nazis invade Hungary. Hungary was the largest and last mostly intact Jewish population in Europe. There are about 800,000 Jews in Hungary, 600,000 Hungarian Jews, and 2,000 who had escaped into safety or what they hoped would be safety in Hungary. So when the Nazis invade um, and all of these people are suddenly at risk, the War Refugee Board panics, and they even add a paragraph to Roosevelt's statement specifically addressing um, what uh, would be perpetrators in Hungary saying, as a result of the events of the last few days, hundreds of thousands of Jews who while living under persecution had at least found a haven from death in Hungary and the Balkans are now threatened with annihilation. That these innocent people should perish on the very eve of triumph would be a major tragedy. 
So it's really hard to measure the effects of psychological warfare. Um, but I actually learned about this leaflet from a German man who remembered finding a similar leaflet as a teenager. He was a member of the Hitler Youth and he was doing farm labor in Germany in the spring of 1933 or 1944. And he discovered this leaflet in a potato field. Allied propaganda was really smart. So um, on a lot of pieces of Allied propaganda, they would advertise local bombing raids. So they would say, this, um, the US just bombed this factory in your town. And so you on the ground would know that that was true. You know, you saw it, you, you may have witnessed it. Um, and so then they put information like this on here. And so the German man that I talked to said that as a teenager, this is how he learned about the Holocaust and he believed what he was hearing. The US government through the War Refugee Board also laundered money uh, to help Jews sneak into Sweden. Um, and to help refugees sneak into Sweden. So I, I've spoken a couple of times at the Treasury Department and they're, they're not as thrilled as I am about calling it money laundering. They, they tend to think that um, money laundering is something other countries do and they are not so thrilled about my use of that term, but they agreed I could call it secret money transfers. I think they're largely the same thing. Um, and I think, it's, I think that the US is absolutely laundering money at this point. It is a very much a secret money transfer to do something that the, the host country, Sweden, did not want us to do. So this is Ivor Olson. Um, Ivor Olson was the Treasury Department's financial attache to the Stockholm legation. Uh, which sounds like a very boring job, except that he's also an OSS spy. It was the precursor to the CIA. So he, his code name was Crispin, and he was positioned at the Stockholm legation specifically to oversee the movement of money and war material between Sweden and Nazi Germany. Um, so a very important job. Um, he is also, incidentally, the man who um, hires Raoul Wallenberg the now famous Swedish businessman. Many people don't know that Wallenberg um, was sent to Hungary at the, at the request of the War Refugee Board. The War Refugee Board asked um, all of the neutral nations, will you increase your diplomatic representation in Hungary? Will you allow more people to go there and help Jews in Hungary? And Sweden says, yes. And Sweden said, who do you wanna send? And Ivor Olson selected Raoul Wallenberg, uh, who worked in the same office building that he did. So um, very important job. That is not uh, the money laundering story, however. So Olson in the summer of 1944 is really focused on getting people out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia by water. Uh, he had heard that if he could get enough money and distribute it to partisan groups, to underground groups in Sweden, uh, to a Lithuanian group, a Latvian group, an Estonian group, they would use that money to buy guns and boats. Um, they would take the boats across the North Sea, land in the Baltics, um, and they would bring people out and, and bring them to the islands off the coast of Sweden. The US does not want Sweden to know that we're doing this. Um, Olson writes that, that the Swedish government shouldn't know and the Swedish people shouldn't know that the United States is doing this. He says that um, Swedish Jews are, and this is a quote, are very interested in Jewish relief and rescue operations as long as they do not involve bringing them into Sweden. So, the US government, which, which had been become experts in trying to keep US companies from sneaking money overseas, um, decided that they were going to sneak money overseas. So John Paley um, contacts the staff at Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio at their headquarters and says, we are going to put $50,000 on the books of your headquarters in Ohio. And in exchange, your factory in Norrköping, Sweden is going to give $50,000 worth of Swedish kronor to Ivor Olsen for his projects. There is no record of any of this in any of the War Refugee Board's boxes and boxes of correspondence. Um, but like I said, Henry Morgenthau was a really good record keeper. And when the War Refugee Board staff sought to erase any um, evidence of this deal, they forgot to go into Morgenthau's records and erase the evidence that he had. Um, so I found this in Henry Morgenthau's records. And you can see it says, this arrangement worked well, and although not foolproof, it's desirable from a security point of view. At this time, we do not recommend bank transfers as receipt of cable transfers of such size by individuals involved in operations 
unavoidably attract notice and suspicion. So the War Refugee Board manages not to get six or 700 out, which is what Olson had been hoping for, but about 4,000 people out of these countries. Um, as far as we know, none of them are Jewish, uh, in part because unfortunately the Jewish communities in those areas are largely gone already by 1944. And also because the, the Jews who are still there um, are deep in hiding and understandably very nervous about and suspicious about this idea of emerging from hiding, making it to a beach, getting on a speedboat, and then trying to make it to an island off the coast of, of Sweden when the Red Army will be coming to liberate. So most of the people who are escaping end up being political opponents of both the Nazis and the Soviet Union. In Switzerland, which is surrounded by enemy territory, the War Refugee Board can't get somebody in to serve as the representative. They have to find somebody who's already there. Um, this is Roswell McClelland. He was 30 years old. He was a native of California. And he was an aid worker with the, with the American Friends Service Committee, with the Quakers. Um, he and his wife had been working in first in Italy for the Quakers and then in southern France, um, helping refugees uh, who had made it to southern France get visas and get to the United States. Um, McClellan actually even witnessed deportations from some of the internment camps in southern France um, to Auschwitz in the summer of 1942 before he escaped over the border into Switzerland with his pregnant wife. They were planning to just kind of wait out the war in safety in Switzerland. And so he's, he's 30 years old, like I said, and he is in charge of some of the most um, daring and complicated rescue schemes that the War Refugee Board has. Switzerland is really a hub of all of these different underground groups operating in and out. Um, and among other things, he um, and Sally Meyer, who was the Joints representative in Switzerland, uh, they get involved in ransom negotiations with the Nazis. The Nazis are looking around at the same landscape as everybody else. They're looking around and saying, well, the allies are likely to win, but maybe if they say they care about the Jews, maybe we can get something for the Jews. So they offer basically Jews for sale. Um, the United States is, is never going to pay ransom, um, but McClellan and Meyer managed to string a high ranking group of Nazis along for about seven months. Uh, in November, 1944, McClellan even goes to Zurich to one of the fancy hotels in the banking district. And he meets with SS Obersturm von Fuhrer Kurt Becker, who is dressed in an SS uniform. Becker reports directly to Adolf Eichmann. And McClellan claims that he is President Roosevelt's personal emissary, uh, expressing the president's personal interest um, in the fate of the negotiations. Um, he does not tell Washington that he has done this. Um, he went completely rogue in that way, um, but it manages to get, they managed to get about 1600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen uh, as a direct uh, response to these ransom negotiations. Beyond all of this, the War Refugee Board, as, as Beth said, they open a refugee camp in upstate New York, uh, bringing about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there. Largely, this is, this is again about not being hypocrites, about saying we cannot deal with this idea that we are asking all of these neutral nations of Europe to take refugees and they're turning around and saying, well, why isn't the United States taking anyone? So we bring a group of refugees to upstate New York. Um, we put them, as Beth showed you, behind a barbed wire fence. Um, and we say they are guests of the president until the war is over, and then they will return to Europe. Um, this launches, you know, after the war, a huge protest movement about not sending them back. And finally, in December 1945, uh, eight months after the end of the war, almost eight months, um, President Truman finally says that the refugees will be allowed to stay in the United States. Um, I saw on the chat that someone here is, is a child of one of the Krauthammer kids. Uh, there were three Krauthammer kids. It was a family of five. There was uh, Simon, Julius, and Susanna. Um, so I'd love to connect with you. Uh, after this is over. Um, another thing the War Refugee Board did is they sent 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. Um, say This was a very long process, as you can imagine, getting all of the approvals to send really valuable food into Nazi territory. But in the final weeks of the war, 
There are packages that go to Dachau, to Sachsenhausen, to Ravensbrück, that the Red Cross distributed to people who are on forced marches, death marches on the sides of the road. Um, so if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package, it was almost certainly packed in the United States, shipped across the ocean, disguised as a Red Cross package and distributed uh, by and paid for by the United States government. Um, the War Refugee Board also gives Americans the very first information that they have about, um, about Auschwitz. It's the first time most Americans have ever heard of it. Uh, in the fall of 1944, the War Refugee Board gets a copy of a report that they call German Extermination Camps Auschwitz and Birkenau. Uh, it was a report written by two escapees from Auschwitz. It's very detailed, it's very graphic. And without asking anyone in the US government, the War Refugee Board issues this to the press and says on executive office of the president stationary, it is a fact beyond denial that the Germans have deliberately and systematically murdered millions of innocent civilians, Jews and Christians alike all over Europe. They send this out to the press, they release it to the press and it is front page news, Thanksgiving weekend, 1944. Um, this is from the Louisville Courier. Uh, and you can see that they even made it, I think pretty small type so that they could fit as much of this information as possible to their readers. Um, like I said, it is front page news across the country. And a week after this, the Washington Post editorial board issues an editorial entitled Genocide. Uh, it is the first time that word is used in an American newspaper. Uh, and they say that the War Refugee Board has introduced Americans to a new crime. Um, so the first time that the word genocide is used is directly in response to the story of Auschwitz that Americans are learning about. Um, so like I said, liberation was still shocking to people, but this was not something that Americans who were paying attention did not know was happening. Um, one of the things that, that I find really interesting, and I'll kind of wrap up with this, is that the War Refugee Board's creation was and remain, remains the only time the US government ever did this, the only time that we have created a new government agency specifically trying to save the victims of our wartime enemy. Um, we do a lot for refugees after the war, um, but it's generally, there are multiple reasons for doing it. Um, there's the Cold War, there's intelligence, there's um, factors beyond American control, but there's always a cynical kind of secondary motive to our efforts on behalf of refugees, largely. And the War Refugee Board is different than that. It wasn't part of a larger piece of prestige. It wasn't trying to curry favor with a specific group. It wasn't about bringing the refugees here and using their intelligence the way we did with, with Hungarians during the Cold War. Um, most Americans still don't want immigrants after the war, um, but it was about keeping them alive. Um, Yehuda Bauer, who is historian emeritus at Yad Vashem, wrote, what made the WRB such a unique body is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. So one of my goals, I think, with, with this book and with this talk is that I'm hoping that um, the War Refugee Board will start to enter our public narrative. I think it's really relevant history. A lot of the things that they were discussing back then are still things that we discuss today. Um, so how to bring refugees in when there are very real national security concerns. What is the role of ransom negotiations when people are being held hostage? Um, how do we kind of weigh the difference between relief for a lot of people and rescuing a few people? What is the responsibility of Americans in the world in a humanitarian way? I think the War Refugee Board ex explores that. The staff is exploring that in, in 1944. And so by forgetting that they exist or by not having it as part of our national kind of story, um, we have lost the ability to learn from what they were doing. Uh, and to use, to honor their efforts and to use them as an example as we continue to discuss kind of the same, um, the same arguments and, and confront the same challenges as we did back then. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to get to your questions. I talked a little long, I always do, and I apologize. Um, but I'm eager to get to any questions that, that anybody might have and, and thank you so much for listening.
Rebecca, thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation and you just are a wealth of information. Um, so we're gonna try to pick your brain uh, and, and open up the, the q and I've been trying to monitor some of the questions that have been coming in on the chat and, uh, and, and on the Q&A feature. And um, I, I think we'll open up with uh, one of the first uh, people who typed in a question was, how vocal were US citizens who were themselves anti-Semitic? They're, they were very vocal and it's, it, I mean, it's very um, upsetting to kind of go through these letters. Um, pe people talked about immigrants, but it was very clear they were talking about Jews and they used a lot of the same anti-Semitic tropes we, we have today. Jews control the media, Jews have too much power. Obviously none of that is true, um, but it was, it was used very similarly as an argument to keep these these particular Jews out. We don't need more Jews here, is what they said, um, and, in, in much angrier words. Right, <laughs> and, re and related to that, that, that question, another person asked, um, did FDR realize how anti-Semitic Breckenridge Long was? FDR has a, a, an unfortunate soft, soft spot for Breckenridge Long, it seems. Even when Morgenthau comes to him and says, this is what the State Department is doing. This is what Breckenridge Long is doing. FDR's response is like, oh no, not Breck, not <laughs> him. He had been a fundraiser for FDR. Um, he had been FDR's first uh, ambassador to Italy um, when FDR became president. And so he has this unfortunate soft spot for him that I think is a huge problem right. um, and, and really uh, got in the way of the United States doing a lot more because it, it is very clear, and I don't want my book to, to get in the way of the idea that the United States could have done a lot more um, to rescue to rescue Jews, especially in the 1930s, when it was clear what was happening. We could have brought in more immigrants, but there was this idea of the American people don't want that, and we're not going to push the boat on it or push the, the conversation on it. Okay, and that, that kind of gets into another area that some of the questions that have come in have, a person has asked, um, given that the, the massive undertaking for the U.S. to amass its, its forces and troops for the D-Day invasion, um, this person says uh, or asks, how do you propose that the U.S. liberate Jews sooner before we had a foothold on the European continent and worked our way over to Germany and Poland, especially knowing that just sending supplies would have been seized by the Nazis and would have enabled them to purchase more armaments for their own military? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think the War Refugee Board does honestly the best that they can do. One of the rules that they have, really the only main rule that they're given by FDR is, is you can do everything in your power to provide relief and to try to save people as long as it does not interfere with the successful prosecution of the war. You cannot do anything that harms the war effort. And they take this very seriously. So one of the things that you hear about a lot is, is requests to bomb Auschwitz. And that comes through the War Refugee Board. Um, Jewish organizations request the War Refugee Board to, to push this. They go to the War Department and they say, should we do this? Can you look into it? And the war, if you, the war Department responds, this is not our priority, um, that we are not going to do this. They, they make all sorts of excuses about how it's very different from other cases and how they are not going to get involved in anything like this. Finally, in November 1944, it takes that long, but in November 1944, the War Refugee Board actually pushes the War Department and says, we think you should do this. And the War Department once again says, this is not our concern. This is not our affair. Um, so I think what the U.S. could have done during the war um, is push the neutral nation sooner, um, make it clear that we are interested in this. That is something that could have been done in 1942. It could have been done in 1943. Whether it would have worked, I don't know, but right. we didn't do anything. And so something <laughs> is better than nothing, right. um, I think. And so I, I think everything that they did that could have been earlier and could have been turned up a notch. Right. Um, but I don't fault the War Refugee Board staff for this. It, it is clear that they were pushing against forces that were some cases also within the Roosevelt administration. Right. And then I guess related to that, um, I, I 
we had a question that came in that says, was Congress made aware of the persecution of the Jews or was it only within the State Department and within the, the War Refugee Board and, and the Treasury Department? No, Congress is very aware. In fact, one of, one of the things that I didn't mention is that the organizers of the pageant that I mentioned, the We Will Never Die pageant, um, they get their supporters in Congress in the fall of 1943 to issue a statement and to have a resolution. It was in the Senate and in the House um, calling on Roosevelt to create an agency dedicate or a commission dedicated to trying to rescue Jews. So this is another thing that Roosevelt is coming up against, that he has pressure from the Treasury Department, he has pressure from Congress, pressure theoretically then from the American people. I'm, I'm not sure how much it's the American people or how much it's just some interested and vocal members of Congress. Um, but there is some pressure to do something. And, and I think a lot of that is coming from the fact that we are winning the war. Right. Um, I'm not sure that those voices would have been there in 1942 when it was a little dicier as to who was going to win. But in 1944, it seems like, you know, we can yes and this, we can win the war and we can try to rescue people. It doesn't seem as precarious. And so there are members of Congress and, and in the 30s too, um, there are a few vocal members of Congress. Emanuel Seller, for example, in New York is very vocal from the beginning about needing to do more, needing to change immigration, needing to bring in refugee kids, needing to, um, needing to expand our quotas or use all of the in, in, um, immigration slots that we have. And he is not, um, he is not joined by many other voices. Right. Well, I, I, I've seen from the, the chat, a lot of people also wanted to, to ask you why the United States government didn't make an effort to bomb more of the railway lines. So would yeah. you mind commenting on that as well? I mean, the War Department gives the same excuses that they do when it, when it comes to bombing the camp itself. Um, they argue that the rail lines can be repaired very quickly and so it's not worth doing. Um, they claim that they are busy elsewhere um, and to the War Refugee Board, that's convincing in June 1944, when they say we're busy elsewhere and the War Refugee Board knows that they've just landed on Normandy, they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll maybe believe that. It gets a little less convincing in, in the fall of 1944 when we've clearly, you know, taken Italy, you know, the, we're, we're on German territory, for goodness sake. Like, it's not convincing that we can't reach the rail lines. Um, but the War Department is, is resolute in saying this is not going to be our priority. Okay, and let's, let's switch gears. I had an interesting question from someone who says, if you wants to know if you could comment on uh, the, the work by Eric Larson in the Garden of the Beast, mm -hmm. uh, where William Dodd, the US ambassador to Nazi Germany sent personal messages to FDR about the conditions in Germany of the 30s and 40s regarding the position of Jews. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am a big fan of that book. I'm a big fan of Larson in general. And um, I heard that they're going to make a movie of it. And I hope with Tom Hanks, I think is wow. that's going to be, that's going to be really interesting. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you are in the know, Rebecca. <laughs> I know. I got my fingers crossed on that because I think it's really interesting. Um, so FDR, Dodd is his fourth or fifth pick. No, he can't find anybody who wants to take the position of ambassador to Germany, especially after everybody's reading the headlines in 1933 and is like, I don't, I'm not interested in going and doing that. So he picks Dodd, who's a history professor. Um, I have, as you can understand, a soft spot for history professors. As yes. I Yes, yay. <laughs> um, but I don't know that I would be a very good diplomat. So, right. <laughs> and I think that is necessarily maybe true of Dodd too. Um, okay. So he annoys most of the Nazi hierarchy. Um, <laughs> and therefore, to some extent, that makes him not a great diplomat. You need to be able to meet with people. And by 1934, he's basically said, I'm not meeting with these people anymore. These people are nuts. And um, I, it is not going to be what I do. And so his... Um, the official kind of career diplomats start to undermine him a little okay. bit. And finally he leaves in 1937 um, and, and they bring in somebody who is more of a career diplomat to kind of handle all of the diplomatic niceties that you are supposed to have when you are two friendly nations right. just getting along. 
Um, <laughs> So well, no, it, but it's a fascinating book, and and as far as I know, I've I've been in the Dodd papers too. The scholarship's on, is on point. So okay, yeah. that that's a good endorsement. That that is good. Um, I, I think related to that, I had another diplomatic kind of related question, and that was one about um, uh, JFK's father, Joe Joseph Kennedy, and the question asked about in his position as ambassador to England. Uh, how much information would he have possibly had access to regarding the genocide um, and kind of what was his his position if you could comment on that yeah so if my memory serves and again he is not my my area of expertise he is gone by the time mass killing begins okay. but he is the the ambassador to the court of saint james the u.s ambassador to great britain um, during the refugee crisis and so he gets involved with issues like the St. Louis when, when Britain actually brings in a portion of the refugees on the St. Louis. And he is there when the kinder transports begin. Um, now he is an anti-Semite and he um, advocates very strongly that the United States should not be allowing in more immigrants. And so um, he, he is a strong voice, but he also doesn't get along with FDR very well. So I don't, mm. I don't know how much of an influence he actually had on the president. Okay, and, and that actually, since you raised the issue of the St. Louis, we've had a, a few people also adding in questions about uh, what were the circumstances of the St. Louis ship and why was it turned, uh, where was it originally going and mm -hmm. why was it turned away? So if you could just maybe, that might be our, our final question that we can have time for for today. Yeah, I'll give my, my quickest version of the St. Okay. Louis story. So the, <laughs> the St. Louis sailed from Hamburg in May 1939. So this is before the war began. Um, it's carrying more than 900 mostly Jewish refugees on their way to Cuba. They had purchased Cuban landing permits, most of them. Um, and over 700 of them were on the waiting list to the United States. So they had not presented their paperwork. They did not have visas to enter the United States as immigrants. They were planning to go to Cuba and wait in safety there. Um, on the way, while the ship was at sea, uh, the Cuban government canceled their landing permits. Um, they had purchased them from a corrupt Cuban official, and State Department officials um, estimated that this corrupt official had raised over a million dollars in, in 1939 money, so 15, 16 million dollars today, wow. just selling entry visas to Jewish refugees. Um, and so the Cuban government was trying to crack down on that. And one of the things that they did was they canceled these landing permits. The refugees land in Cuba. They are there for over a week as the US and, and the joint, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee starts negotiating with the Cuban government to let at least these passengers off right. and passengers from two, two or three other small ships um, also carrying Jewish refugees. Um, it doesn't work. And finally, the Cuban government says, we will not negotiate anymore while the ship is in Havana Harbor. So the St. Louis then goes off the coast of Miami, kind of hovering near Havana in case the negotiations start to go better um, and they can bring the passengers back. It's clear that's not going to happen. Um, there are petitions from Americans asking the government to make an exception to figure out a way to let them in. Uh, it is at the end of the immigration year. And so there actually are no more visas left to people wow. born in Germany. Um, so it would have taken some sort of act of Congress or the president to actually let them in. It's not like they could just skip the line. Right. So the boat heads back um, towards Europe. And on the way, the joint negotiates with the governments through the State Department with the governments in Great Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France to each take a portion of the passengers. So they are not uh, they are not sent back to Nazi Germany. They're not sent back to a nation at war. Germany is not at war yet. Um, and it's considered a huge success story at the time. It's considered, you know, the, the joint even makes a fundraising film about what a great job they did with mm -hmm. the St. Louis. We know now that the passengers who go back to France, the Netherlands and, and Belgium will be caught again a year later when the Nazis invade those territories. Um, so we know now that 254 of the 937 passengers are murdered in the Holocaust. Um, two thirds of them survive and a third of them are murdered. My goodness. Thank you. You know, I, I, we have so many good questions rolling in. And so for pe people who've been typing in 
Um, we often ask our presenters to, to read through the questions and if they have time, they can answer the questions uh, individually. Um, I'm getting a lot of pleas on the chat to mention that Eric Larson is actually is local? Uh, yeah. from Capitol Hill in Seattle. Yeah. So a lot of local pride, all right, you know, there we go. Um, and Rebecca, I wanna thank you so much for sharing. And it's obvious you could talk for the whole afternoon and I think everybody would just <laughs> Good. you know what would want you to continue on so thank you so very much uh for being with us today and for sharing your research and you, you keep on digging through those archives because you come up with some fantastic uh, examples that people really don't know the the real story until an archivist really digs through uh and makes it a, a really fascinating historical account so thank you so much for for everything today i really appreciate it yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay. And I'd like to also uh, to end our program. Thank you to all of the participants and thank you so much. I apologize for not being able to get to every single question uh, that, that people have been typing in, but we'll try our best to respond to them. I'd also like to thank again, our community partners, uh, including the Powell Family Foundation, the Museum Educators of Puget Sound, Museum of Flight, Northwest Film Forum, Puget Sound Honor Flight, Southwestern Seattle Historical Society, and Washington State Archives. This program has been recorded and you'll find it on our website starting tomorrow along with other past Lunch and Learn presentations. As anyone who ever participates and, and witnesses these programs, you know that it takes a dedicated team at the Holocaust Center to keep everything up and running. Uh, I was especially nervous today because it's a terrible wind and rainstorm and I really was worried my internet was gonna go out. Uh, so I wanna give a special thanks uh, to Richard Green who is the museum and technology director. He makes it all happen smoothly and uh, comforts us with all of our anxiety. Um, I'd also like to give a sincere thanks to Alana Cohn Kennedy, uh, who lets me uh, stand in for her sometimes and kind of channel my inner Oprah. Uh, and so I really thank her. I also want to extend thanks to the executive director of the Seattle Holocaust Center for Humanity, Dee Simon, who invited PLU and Holocaust and Genocide Studies program to help organize the series. And finally, I'd love to invite everyone who participated today uh, to join us next Tuesday for the third part of our series on America and the Holocaust, offered in partnership with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program and the Kurt Mayer Chair of Holocaust Studies at Pacific Lutheran University. Thank you again to all of our community sponsors. Next Tuesday, October 20th at noon Pacific Standard Time, we'll be exploring Hollywood and anti-Semitism with Professor Stephen Carr, Director of the Institute for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Please join us. And this concludes our program.